presentation. Um, <clears throat> just as a, uh, a little bit of context of how I got to be doing this, I started as a computer science major, and then I became a computational biologist. Uh, and my first paper ever was uh, on cardiac electrophysiology. <laughs> Uh, and then in grad school at Harvard, I was in the systems biology PhD program, and I found about evolutionary game theory and uh, the prisoner's dilemma, and I totally fell in love, and then I gradually evolved into a social scientist. Uh, and the reason that I find cooperation so compelling is that on the one hand, <clears throat> it's totally essential for everything in life, from this functioning of the cells in our body, our personal relationships, friendships, professional relationships, management of organizations, and global level issues like uh, conservation and climate change. And what all these things have in common is that they're non-zero sum. That is to say, everyone's better off when everyone cooperates, so cooperation is sort of socially desirable. But at the same time, uh, cooperation presents a challenge because creating those collective benefits requires individuals to incur costs. And so both from the perspective of natural selection and uh, classic economic models of rational self-interest, cooperation seems puzzling. Like, you know, how do we explain the fact that uh, organisms are willing to reduce their own pit payoff, their own fitness, uh, to increase others? Um, and the way that I think about this is using game theory. The basic idea of game theory is that <clears throat> it gives you a language for formalizing strategic interactions. Uh, or a different way of putting it sort of more biological is it's a way of capturing frequency-dependent fitness. Uh, that is to say, how successful an action is depends on what everybody else is doing. Um, and so you have a set of players. Uh, each player has a set of actions. And then you specify the payoff that each player gets uh, based on the, all, for any possible combination of actions by all the players. And once you have this, uh, you can have a sort of formal description of any kind of social interaction that you want. And there are basic tools for asking what are optimal strategies, what strategies should you ex expect evolution to favor. And using this approach to think about cooperation, the prisoner's dilemma is the classic game. Uh, one way of describing the prisoner's dilemma, which is the one that I like, is you imagine two people simultaneously make a binary choice between two options. Either you can cooperate, which means paying a cost C to give a greater benefit B to the other person, or you can do nothing. Uh, and so the, pay the payoff matrix is the workhorse of game theory. Uh, so if both people cooperate, then each person pays the cost but gets the benefit back from the other person. So that's a positive outcome. Whereas if both people defect, no one gets anything. And so this. Uh, you know, shows the sort of collective benefits. Mutual cooperation is better than mutual defection. But if one person cooperates while the other person defects, the cooperator pays the cost and doesn't get anything, and the defector gets the benefit without having to pay the cost. It's just a symmetric thing. And so that means that uh, the best possible payoff is for you to defect while the other person cooperates. And more generally, no matter what the other person does, you always do better defecting than cooperating. So the prisoner's dilemma illustrates this tension between what's best for the individual and what's best for uh, the sort of group as a whole. And uh, the way that I ch typically think about uh, understanding these games is through the lens of evolutionary game theory, um, which is either sort of descriptions of actual genetic evolution or various learning processes involving imitation, where people tend to copy uh, strategies that are successful uh, for others. And to sort of you see the puzzle of cooperation from this perspective. Say we have some population of 20 agents, and we start out, say, everyone's a cooperator. So this is a good uh, beneficial outcome. If you put in one defector, and now everybody plays the prisoner's dilemma with each other, uh, and that means that all the cooperators, they pay the cost 19 times for each of the other people, and they get back 18 benefits from the 18 other cooperators, whereas the one defector just gets 19 benefits, doesn't pay any cost. No matter what the cost and the benefit is, the defector always does better than the cooperators. And so the way these dynamics work, or sample one of them, is you pick a random agent to change strategy, which is to die in the language of real evolution, or to update strategy in the, in the language of uh, social learning. And then you pick an agent to copy uh, proportional to payoff. And so the higher the payoff is, the more likely they are to get picked. So in this situation, the defector is more likely to get picked uh, than the cooperators. And then the picked person either reproduces and fills the empty spot left by the dead agent, or this person that's deciding to change strategy imitates uh, the selected person. 
and so then it changes to defection. Now you recalculate the payoffs. It's still the case the defectors are doing better. And so eventually you run this long enough and you wind up with 100% defection. The average payoff is lower, so it's this interesting situation where evolution, this optimizing force, actually winds up reducing overall payoffs. Um, and this creates a picture that doesn't match very well with what we see in the world, where cooperation is this central part of, uh, of not just human behavior, but a sort of a central part of life across you know, many scales in the natural world. So the question is, how do we explain cooperation? And in particular, what I care about is how do we explain the fact that people cooperate with each other? And a big part of that explanation is strategic. That is to say that cooperation can actually be in your long run self-interest if uh, you take into account some of the modifications from that one-shot prisoner's dilemma setup that we started with. Uh, for example, when agents interact repeatedly, then it can be worth paying the cost of cooperating today in order to get the reciprocal cooperation from the other person in the future. Um, when you have dynamic social networks that, where people can make and, form, uh, make, make and break ties, then cooperators gain uh, links um, and social capital and defectors get ostracized. Uh, when you have reputation systems, then it's worth paying the cost of cooperating in order to get a good reputation so other people will cooperate with you in the future. And a lot of what institutions do uh, are punish bad behavior, reward good behavior, create incentives to cooperate. Um, and there's been a ton of work on all of these things. I've also worked in, in each of these particular applications doing um, formal models and behavioral experiments. Uh, but that's not, I'm not going to talk about any of that today. Um, except to say that what all of these things boil down to is the idea that you start with a social dilemma, a prisoner's dilemma, where defection is better than cooperation no matter what, and all of these mechanisms create future consequences for your current behavior, which transforms the social dilemma into what we would call a coordination game. That is to say, it makes it that uh, if the other person cooperates, it becomes payoff maximizing for you to also cooperate. Whereas if the other person defects, it's payoff maximizing for you to defect. And so it creates a self-interested motive to cooperate, conditional on the other person also being cooperative. So it can create sort of uh, evolutionarily stable cooperative outcomes. And I think that this kind of strategic cooperation is really important for explaining a lot of, uh, of human cooperation. But it's also very clear both from tons of lab experiments and I hope from just introspection on daily life that there's also a lot of situations where people wind up cooperating even in the absence of incentives to cooperate. This is what I'm going to call pure cooperation. So situations where no matter what the other person does, it's always in your narrow self-interest to defect and not cooperate. So I want to explain why do people engage in pure cooperation. And when you think about it from uh, the, the perspective of normal game theory, uh, if you have a sort of classical game theory that assumes that people optimizes their payoffs, it's not no help at all, because very clearly people should not ever be cooperating in one-shot games. Um, since it's never payoff maximizing. Uh, and so the typical solution in behavioral economics is to assume that people care about things other than just money. You know, like, for example, uh, people might care about equity, might people, people might care about efficiency or you know, maximizing the total size of the pie. And uh, that's great, and I think that that's clearly true in a sort of proximate sense. But for me, this is an unsatisfying explanation because what I want to know is where do those preferences come from? Like, why should we have social preferences? Or why should we behave in ways that seem consistent with social preferences? And uh, the approach that I've been taking for trying to get insight into this is uh, adding some amount of cognition into these models that are typically totally free. Uh, they're just purely based on behavior. An agent has a strategy that specifies its behavior, and that's the end of the day. And the particular dimension of cognition that I have been focusing on is the trade-off between ease and flexibility. And uh, you know, the, the basic idea is that if you want to have a decision process, the more sensitive you want to be to the details of the decision that you're making, the more it's going to cost you in terms of time or cognitive effort or whatever. And uh, I will say that the way that I think about this, uh, oh, yes. What is the evidence that people actually engage in pure cooperation? So there's like, um, 
hundreds or thousands of experiments basically showing that in one-shot anonymous games, as I say, you're going to play one-shot prisoner's dilemma with some other person, you're never going to see them again, and you still get a lot of cooperation. So that's after like a lifetime of conditioning potentially in other circumstances. Right, which is what, which is what my argument is, basically. Okay. So you would, that, that, by your definition, that's pure cooperation. That is, in the context of that one situation, they're making a decision that's not consistent with their, with their payoff. Um, but you can, if you, from this, you can extrapolate. What I'm going to argue is that a lot of time people are using relatively inflexible decision rules that are shaped by their prior experience where it's actually good to cooperate. And uh, as a sort of disclaimer, I'll say that the way that I uh, sort of think about or, and talk about this often sort of uses these dual process intuition deliberation frameworks as a metaphor, but like, <clears throat> I just see that as a nice limiting case that discretizes something to make it clear what's going on. But for me, it's, it's, it's a metaphorical thing, and it's a, it's a useful language for talking to people that use that language you know, to make something intuitively compelling uh, for them. But I never thought of this as like an actual thing uh, that was you know, literally two processes or whatever. And some of what I'll talk about today, uh, I hope, will illustrate that. OK, so to take this idea uh, of ease versus flexibility and incorporate it into a game theoretic model uh, of cooperation, uh, there are sort of two changes that we make from standard cooperation type models. First of all, we assume that agents aren't always doing facing the same game, but the environment varies trial by trial. And in the spirit of simplicity and limiting cases, we say there's two types of games instead of one. Either there's one shot prisoner's dilemmas where it's always better to defect, or there's repeated games where there's a cooperative, uh, there's a sort of coordination flavor. Um, and then we also assume that uh, when you're trying to decide what to do, you have to trade off uh, between ease and flexibility, unlike the standard game theory models where you assume that the agents have uh, you know, total flexibility, access to all information for free, and can do whatever they want. So to unpack this, the variable environment component, uh, like I said, people are playing prisoner's dilemmas uh, where you can pay a cost C to give a benefit B to the other person. And we say with probability 1 minus P, it's a one-shot prisoner's dilemma. This is just the same prisoner's dilemma payoff from before, where no matter what the other person does, uh, <clears throat> it's better to defect than to cooperate. So it's a social dilemma, pure cooperation setting. Uh, but with probability P, it's a game where future consequences exist. And the way we model future consequences, it we say like when one person cooperates and the other person defects, so the cooperator is paying this cost and the benefit and the defector is getting this benefit, but the future consequences create some kind of compensation for the exploited cooperator and alpha, and they impose some kind of penalty on the exploiting defector uh, beta. And so what I'm going to talk about here is a limiting case of that where we set alpha equals to C and beta equals to B so that there's no benefit to exploiting and there's no cost to being exploited. But in the supplement for this paper, we show that you can do a totally general payoff structure here and it comes out the same. Um, just this way I have two fewer parameters to be keeping track of. And the point is that now this becomes a coordination game where it's actually better to cooperate if the other person cooperates. And so we have this, uh, this carving of the, of the world into times when it's good to defect and times when it's good to cooperate. And I'm going to call these repeated games because this has the payoff structure of the average payoff per round in an infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma. But that's just sort of a shorthand. And it captures all of the different things at the beginning that I talked about where there are future consequences for current actions. OK, so you're playing one of these two types of games. And now. Uh, you have to make your decision. And again, I'm going to start with a limiting case where you have two different ways of making decisions. Either you can choose cooperate or defect without knowing what kind of game you're playing. So it's totally unconditional play. Or you can pay some stochastically sampled cost in order to condition your behavior on the type of game that you're playing. And for simplicity, we assume that this cost is stochastically sampled from the interval, a uniform distribution between 0 and some maximum cost d. And so what this means is that each agent has uh, four, their strategy is defined by four parameters. Uh, what they choose when they don't condition their behavior on game type, and they, you know, they, do, they go the sort of cognitively free route. Uh, 
what they choose to do when they do condition and realize it's a one-shot game, what they do when they do condition and realize it's a repeated game, and then this sort of metacognitive parameter, which is what's the maximum cost that you're willing to pay uh, in order to, uh, to get the flexible decision making. And so on a trial by trial basis, it's seeing different costs and it's deciding if that cost is less than T, I'll pay it and I'll condition. If it's greater than T, I won't pay it and I'll use the unconditional strategy. And just to sketch it out, the first thing that happens is in each trial is you randomly sample the cost. Uh, and then the metacognitive decision happens where if the cost is greater than your agent's threshold, then it uses the unconditional choice and doesn't pay that cost. If the cost is less than the threshold or equal to it, then it does pay it and chooses to condi condition. And then uh, you know, it's either a one-shot game or a repeated game with probability one minus P or P. And if the flexibility cost is too high such that you go unconditional, you cooperate with probability SI regardless of what game type it is because you weren't able to condition. Whereas uh, if you do pay to condition, then you, know, you choose the strategy dep that depends on the game type. So that's the basic setup. Are there questions about that? Yes. <laughs> uh, so OK, so we've got this basic setup. So, uh, right, so maybe this is a, a, an important point that the way, so in, in these studies, you assume there are certain things that are properties of the environment that you fix. And then there are other things that uh, evolve, then where you're sort of asking, what will this come to be? And so here what we do is we fix the maximum cost, we fix the probability of one shot repeated game versus repeated game, and we fix the benefit and cost of cooperation. And then we ask, in a world with those parameters, what T gets produced. Um, and uh, you can start by doing um, these sort of analytical calculations, either asking what are Nash equilibria or what are evolutionarily stable strategies. And when you do it for this game, it turns out there's only two possible strategies that are ever equilibria. The first one is sort of boring. It's this classic uh, always defect strategy that just says its unconditional choice is to defect, and it never conditions. Even if, even if it only costs epsilon, it says, no, thank you. I'm just going with defect. I don't even need to look. Um, and on the other one, you have the strategy I'm going to call kind of default cooperator, because its unconditional strategy is to cooperate. Um, but sometimes it does pay to condition, and when it pays to condition, when it realizes there are future consequences, it sticks with cooperating. But when it realizes it's in a one-shot game, it switches to defecting. Um, and the optimal T that comes out is uh, C times 1 minus P. Uh, that is to say, it's willing to pay a cost to, to decide flexibly to condition its play when that cost is less than this key quantity. And what you see that this key quantity is, so, OK, so for this strategy, what's the benefit of conditioning? It allows it to not waste money cooperating when it finds itself in a one-shot game. So how much is that worth on average? Well, the ability to avoid wasting that is the amount of money that you waste times the probability you wind up in one of the settings where it would be wasted. So it's basically just this is the expected value of, of flexibility, and so if the cost is less than that expected value, I'll pay it. If it's not, I won't. Um, and so, uh, this so this strategy is always in equilibrium, and this strategy is in equilibrium if the probability of one-shot games is sufficiently large. Uh, sorry, of repeated games. And so the idea is if you're in a world where it's mostly repeated games, it makes sense to have an unconditional strategy of cooperating, and then sometimes, if it's not too costly, adjust to the details of the situation you're in. Um, you can also directly calculate when this should be ex expected to fa be favored by selection. It looks like a mess and isn't really interpretable, but this is what it looks like. I'm going to show you, I'm going to fix the cost of cooperating and the maximum cost of flexibility at one, and I'm um, just going to show you the, the outcomes as a function of the probability that it's a repeated game and how beneficial it is to cooperate. And what you see is that down in the corner where it's mostly one-shot games and cooperation isn't that beneficial, then you get the strategy that always defects and never pays for flexibility. But once you pass that critical 
uh, threshold into it being a, a big enough probability of repeated games, then you get the default cooperator that is uh, being selected. And now I'm showing isoclines for different values of t. And this is sort of what uh, I think the question was about the interaction between p and t, is what you see is that as repeated games get more and more likely, you get less and less willing to pay for flexibility because the more predictable the world is, basically the less useful it is to pay for flexibility. Uh, and and uh, just to give a little bit more of a flavor, I'm going to fix b equals 4, and I'm going to show you the average value of each of the parameters from evolutionary simulations uh, across that value. Um, and so now, I'm, again, I'm varying p, and I'm showing the average value of the four parameters. And so you see that when p is small, you're in the all d equilibrium. So th this, this uh, yellow line is the default, the unconditional response, which is to zero probability of cooperating. And also, it ba basically never um, pay for flexibility. And these two values are down around 0.5, but, which is just random chance because they're never getting used. It's never paying for flexibility. So what it does when it pays for flexibility doesn't matter. Um, and then you get this transition uh, to, to the default cooperator strategy where the default response or the unconditional response jumps up to 100% cooperate. And uh, you get initially a big increase in your willingness to pay for flexibility. But then as the probability of repeated games gets higher and higher, so it's less and less likely that you wind up in a one-shot game where it's useful to be flexible, to get less and less inclined to play for flexibility. And so a consequence of this is that if you just ask uh, conditional on being in a repeated game, how often are people cooperating? And conditional in being a one-shot game, how often are people cooperating? Once you get over this transition into the default cooperator strategy, people are always cooperating in repeated games. But as the probability of it being a repeated game increases, they actually sort of ironically get more and more likely to cooperate in one-shot games. And so this suggests, along the lines of what sort of Josh said at the beginning, um, that uh, what's driving cooperation in one-shot games is the predominance of repeated games. Basically, you're in a world where it's typically good to cooperate, and so it spills over. Um, one interesting feature of this, uh, uh, of this picture here is that there's no strategy that is, um, has an unconditional uh, strategy to defect and then pays uh, for flexibility in order to cooperate when it finds itself in a repeated game, which would be the kind of like symmetric uh, thing to this guy's default is to cooperate, pay for flexibility to defect in one shot. The, the, op the sort of converse uh, isn't in equilibrium. And the reason uh, is you, that you don't get a strategy whose unconditional response is to defect, but who's willing to sometimes pay uh, for flexibility uh, in order to cooperate in repeated games is that in a repeated game, it's only beneficial to switch to cooperating if the other person al is also going to cooperate. And so uh, that means the benefit is it's the probability it's a, um, a repeated game times the benefit that you get from mutual cooperation, but then times this factor that's basically how likely is the other person to deliberate. And if you look at a pl uh, place, you know, we focus on parameter regions where this maximum cost is relatively high so that this quantity is less than one. And what it means is that your optimal deliberation rate is always less than the other person's deliberation rate. Because basically, the benefit that you get from switching to cooperation is discounted by the likelihood that they sort of realize it's uh, repeated also. So anyways, it's this race to the bottom, and you don't get any deliberation. OK. so. Uh, this is this formal model that creates uh, some pretty clear testable predictions. Uh, and in particular, it creates predictions about what happens when you experimentally increase the cost of, uh, of flexibility. And so, oh, and therefore decrease people's uh, you know, likelihood to engage in, in flexible decision making. And so the prediction is that if you're in a one-shot game, Increasing the cost of flexibility is going to make people more likely to cooperate because it's going to make them more likely to go to the, with their unconditional response. And for these default cooperators, the unconditional response is to cooperate. The conditional response is defect. So if you make people less likely to condition, you're going to wind up with more cooperation. Uh, but 
if uh, you look at situations that are not pure cooperation, but are there these situations where future consequences do exist and it has this coordination structure, then you don't expect this to be true anymore. And instead, you, affect there, you expect there to be no effect on cooperation because the dual process guy or you know, whatever, this default cooperator strategy, uh, his unconditional response is to cooperate and the conditional response agrees, yes, cooperating is right. So if you make it less likely that he's gonna condition, that doesn't actually change the behavior. And the strategy that always defects is never using the conditional uh, strategies anyways, so changing the cost of conditioning doesn't affect anything there. So these are the empirical predictions, and then what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna show you some data in support of these predictions. Does this make sense? Any questions? Okay. I see furrowed brows, but not raised. All right, that was the furrowed brow. Uh, so, in this, like in this picture, for example, we're not just asking one shot. We're asking what's the behavior. Mm. So, with, if you know, with probability p, you're playing repeated games. With probability one minus p, you're playing one shot games. And so, your strategy specifies how you play across all settings. And so this guy for this strategy, this sort of default cooperator strategy says, my default is when I don't condition, regardless of whether it's a one-shot game or a repeated game, I cooperate. When I pay to condition, if I realize it's a repeated game, I keep cooperating. If I realize it's a one-shot game, I switch to defecting. So you could you could very easily uh, ch adjust this model to have it be a repeated uh, multiplayer interaction, um, and it wouldn't actually change the predictions that much. Um, and I think that there are actually important psychological differences between group interactions and individual interactions. Uh, and I, basically, I think that's something that this framework could be used to investigate, but I haven't done yet. Although, as you're going to see, a lot of the empirical uh, data that I'm going to show you comes from at least small group interactions, uh, and, and the sort of results fit within the pattern of this. Okay, so if I've got uh, I've got these predictions, um, and now I will present some experimental evidence in support of them. So, first, I'm going to start by looking at the one-shot cooperation prediction. Uh, so. The, the prediction is that increasing the cost of flexibility is going to increase cooperation because it makes people less likely to condition. We have people play a single one-shot uh, public goods game in groups of four. This is like a multiplayer prisoner's dilemma. Each person gets some endowment, and they choose how much to keep for themselves uh, versus how much to contribute to the group, where uh, the contributions are doubled and then split equally. Uh, among the four group members, and so that means if everyone contributes, everyone doubles their money, which is great, but for every dollar that you put in, it gets doubled to two dollars and then split four ways, so you're only getting back 50 cents on the dollar, so you personally lose money on anything that you contribute, and so it's one of these pure cooperation uh, social dilemma situations where you clearly maximize your payoff by not contributing anything. And then to manipulate the cost of, uh, of flexibility, we either put people under time pressure, which makes it more costly uh, to condition, or uh, time delay, which makes it less costly. Um, and an important note here is that this is about actual manipulation. I'm not talking about endogenous uh, reaction time correlations, which I think are influenced by all kinds of things not having to do with uh, level of flexibility. Um, and so, and I'm just going to show, show you the, actu the average fraction of the endowment contributed, uh, you know, for, to the sort of public good uh, in these two different conditions. And we ran it both on MTurk and in the lab. And uh, I remember the prediction is time pressure, more costly to condition, less conditioning, 
more cooperation in this one-shot setting. And that's what we find both uh, online and in the lab. And uh, this is, you know, it makes me very happy. Um, but I think, I think a lesson that has emerged from a lot of this um, all discussion about replication and, uh, and whatnot in uh, the experimental social sciences these days is you shouldn't believe anything because you see a study that finds it. You shouldn't disbelieve anything because you see a study that doesn't find it. But like for these kinds of uh, effects, at least, I want to see meta-analyses to believe what's really going on. So I'm going to show you a meta-analysis. Uh, so in the last few years, there's been a lot of interest in this topic. There's 51 studies with over 15,000 participants that have been run. Uh, that all have this flavor of giving people the choice to pay a real monetary cost to give a real monetary benefit to one or more others. And I'm going to start. These 51 studies are all the sort of pure cooperation, one-shot game situation where there's no strategic or uh, self-interested motive to give. Um, and this cost of uh, flexibility is manipulated either using time pressure or time delay, cognitive load, these kinds of inductions that tell people, you know, just go with your first response or carefully consider what you're doing, um, or ego depletion that gets people to sort of use up their, uh, you know, do some cognitively demanding task beforehand that leaves them tired out or whatever. Um, and an important point for meta-analysis is uh, that Meta-analyses aren't actually very valuable if the data going into them is, uh, is you know, sort of uh, impacted by publication bias or reporting bias. But there's various different tests for bias you can do, and there's not any evidence of publication bias or reporting bias here, in part because I included a bunch of unpublished studies. Um, so I'm going to show you one of these forest plots where I'm the effect size uh, for every study sorted from smallest to largest. And what this effect size is, is it's the change in cooperation uh, that results from increasing the cost of flexibility. So uh, if it's a positive uh, side, that means you have more cooperation in the high cost uh, situation relative to the low cost. So that's sort of as predicted. When it's in the negative side, uh, it's the opposite, that increasing the cost of deliberation or of flexibility uh, decreases cooperation, which is not what's predicted. And here is this forest plot. Uh, you see a bunch of studies that have a big positive effect in the predicted direction, a bunch of studies that have sort of relatively small effects in the predicted direction, and uh, you know a few that all of these are sort of not significantly different in the sort of wrong or unpredicted direction. And only one study out of the 51 studies goes the other direction. So you stick this together, and you get a very significant overall effect. And I think a reasonably meaningful magnitude, where there's about 17% more cooperation in the high flexibility cost conditions relative to the uh, low flexibility cost. So this is uh, meta-analytic support for prediction one, which is in the context of pure cooperation, increasing the cost of flexibility is going to increase cooperation. Um, questions about this? That's a different. That's a different couple of sets of analyses. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So one of them is looking for small study effects where it's bad for business if the effect size gets more positive on average as the sample size gets smaller, uh, and there's no evidence of that. And the other one is the p hacking thing where it's bad if there's a big bump in p values right under 0.05, and there's not any evidence of that. Um, yep. How many you asked for, and where'd you get the raw data? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I did, um, you know, lit searches of all of the popular or the relevant databases, um, and I actually was able to get for a hundred percent of the papers that I found that met the inclusion criteria of an incentivized economic game, um, where the sort of cost of flexibility was manipulated with one of those four manipulation types. Uh, for all of the studies that I was found, I was able to either get the statistic I needed out of the paper or get the data, uh, get the raw data from the authors and do the analysis myself. Um, and in, in addition to doing all that searching, I also emailed um, all of the sort of relevant uh, field email lists soliciting unpublished data and then got a bunch of studies that way also. And in the paper, I've got the, you know, Prisma flowchart thing, but I didn't put it in the talk. For is that answer the question? Yeah. 
Um, OK, so that's, uh, that's good for one-shot cooperation. But uh, the other key prediction is that it shouldn't, in general, be the case that increasing the cost of flexibility increases cooperation. That should be specific to these situations where it's all clearly self-interested uh, to not cooperate. And so I also look at the same thing in the context of strategic cooperation. So these are situations where paying the cost to give to the benefits of the other person could potentially pay off uh, in the future. For example, repeated games or these multi-stage games where you make an action and then the other person responds to your action. Um, and because these are situations where it could be payoff maximizing to cooperate if the other person is also cooperative, we would predict here that changing flexibility shouldn't uh, reduce cooperation. Um, and so for this one, I found 16 studies, 2,000-ish participants. And here's the same sort of forest plot. And there's, as predicted, no significant interaction. This is the overall effect is basically exactly zero. Um, there's totally no effect of a, uh, no evidence of a significant overall effect. And if you do meta regression, putting the pure cooperation and the strategic cooperation together in one meta regression, you see that there's a significantly larger effect of increasing the cost of flexibility on pure cooperation than on strategic cooperation. Right. I mean, a lot of them were because the, the you know the main thing that you're if you're going to manipulate if you're going to do like time pressure or cognitive load in one of these games, often the thing that you're interested in is well how does it change the play in the game. But there are some that were also looking at other things like uh, a lot of them actually were looking at interactions and the, the key thing that this paper was interested in was the interaction between this manipulation and some other stuff. Uh, and I should say that I was maximally conservative in the meta-analysis that in all of the studies that looked that were looking for interactions and had secondary manipulations, I just collapsed over all the secondary manipulations and said, what do you get on average? Uh, OK, so this is, uh, I would argue, um, pretty compelling empirical support for the basic predictions of the models. And this is actually maybe an important uh, general point of the, the kind of models that I do, these evolutionary uh, game theoretic, well, models and game theory in general, is that it's very abstract. And uh, the idea is to come up with these things that I think of as sort of qualitative predictions of the direction things should go. And they're not super detailed mechanistic models that are making quantitative predictions of exactly the kind of things that should happen. But to me, this is the sort of best possible outcome from these kinds of models as you make a general prediction about a direction something should go, you get a lot of data, and it's, uh, it's consistent with that. Um, and I'll talk more about this in the chalk talk part. But something that I'm really interested in is trying to link these kinds of models to the more sort of mechanistically detailed models that do more sort of direct uh, quantitative predictions. OK, so uh, that is the, my sort of uh, empirical section for now. And then I'm going to go back and talk about uh, some new work that we've been doing on the theoretical front, <clears throat> uh, in particular trying to move away from the, the limiting case that uh, was the core of the original model in which you have a choice between paying no cost and being totally inflexible versus paying a cost to get perfect flexibility. Mm -hmm. The comparison of the cooperation game and the prison dilemma game is it, a, is it a concern that the cooperation game is actually simpler cognitively because it's got just one cell that's non-zero payoffs, whereas the present dilemma is somehow complicated itself to, to even understand? Well, in the actual experiments, uh, the the payoff for the in the sort of the few, the like the strategic games. Uh, here, the actual payoff matrix isn't literally that payoff matrix from the model where it's zeros and three cells and B minus C in the third cell. It's just these are all things that are the type of interaction that that is supposed to be an abstract model of. That is situations where it could be payoff maximizing to cooperate if the other person cooperates. The question is, is cooperation <clears throat> intrinsically in some sense? So I, I I don't think so. To me, it seems like, if anything, it's more complicated because it requires doing inference about what the other person is going to do. 
that is, if you're in a coordination situation, that is, to me, the pure cooperation ones are cognitively simple because it's like, hey, I don't even have to care about what the other person does. I should definitely defect. Whereas when you're in these sort of strategic cooperation settings, because it has the coordination flavor, uh, yeah, you need to make uh, some kind of inference about what the other person is going to do and have that guide your behavior. Do you think that cost of conditioning or deliberating stays constant over time? Because it seems to me like, Heuristics don't have to be entirely inflexible. You, it seems to me like you create, um, like there might be cues that you can use to easily decide between um, something being a likely one shot versus a repeated game in the standard environment, like the familiarity of the person that you're yep. potentially cooperating with. And so, um, do you imagine a scenario in which participants can get used to the cues that you're using to to inform them whether or not something is um, repeated or one shot, so that the the cost of deliberating with down and be more yeah, totally. And so in, that's what the, the formal model actually that I was about to talk about looks at exactly that. But I think there's also some empirical evidence uh, in favor of that, which we found in one paper. Uh, we looked at a whole bunch of different studies we ran on Mechanical Turk over a period of a couple of years, when at the beginning, not very many people were doing these types of experiments there. And by the end, everybody and his brother was running these cooperation experiments on Turk. And so I, uh, what we show is that this effect of time pressure basically steadily uh, decreased and went away. Uh, and it, was, it seems to be moderated by the amount of prior experience people have with these one-shot games. And so I think it's exactly what you're saying, that people get used to it. They, they sort of learn this type of game. And then it's no longer uh, cognitively demanding to realize that you should defect here because you've already done it a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. I think you've answered it somewhat. But your model shows that, A, it's heuristic to incorporate. Mm -hmm. B, why? Because it's good for us in the long term. But the experimental data only shows heuristic and mm -hmm. doesn't show why. Right. Right. So uh, that, yes, I agree. Um, and we have another set of experiments that I wasn't going to talk about, but that I can, uh, that tries to sort of directly demonstrate uh, a bit of the why feature, um, which is we have people play. Uh, basically a model of uh, like a high P environment versus a low P environment. Uh, so for 20 minutes, they play uh, repeated prisoner's dilemmas, and either they're long games on average, so it's good to cooperate, or they're short games on average where it's good to defect. And so they learn to cooperate or defect. They spend 20 minutes doing that because it's the self-interested thing to do based on the rules that we assign them to. Um, and then in the second stage, we have them do one-shot anonymous games. Um, this was 96 undergrads uh, at the lab at Harvard. And uh, in the first stage, this is sort of the manipulation check that in the, these are these games, so the model of cultures uh, that is, or institutions, whatever. But so in the situation where um, the rules make it self-interested to cooperate, people learn to cooperate. And where the rules make it self-interested to defect, people learn to defect. And then we show as they sort of habituate to this, uh, so that in the second stage, they play all of these different games, the public goods game that we talked about, a trust game where one person decides whether to send money to the, second, uh, to the other person, in which case it gets tripled. And then the other person chooses how much to send back. A dictator game, which is a unilateral money division. I just give money you know, uh, however I want. And then an ultimatum game where I propose a split and the other person accepts it or rejects it. But anyways, these are all decisions of this flavor where you can play a cost to give a benefit uh, to the other person. And they make a decision in all roles of all games. And the prediction is that the people that got used to cooperating because the incentives made it good for them to cooperate are going to wind up being more pro-social afterwards, even though there's no longer any incentive to do so um, because they habituated to it, basically. Um, and that's what we find. And all these games this is just the CDF of uh, transfer amount. And then the average is shown with um, vertical lines. So the blue is the long games, the sort of culture of cooperation. The red is the short games, the sort of incentive to, to defect. And in every one of these games, uh, on average, people are more pro-social after having spent 20 minutes cooperating uh, than after having spent 20 minutes defecting. Um, and uh, we also present evidence that this is specifically because of this kind of not wanting to pay to condition uh, idea, where we have people do a modified version of this cognitive reflection test afterwards. There are these three math problems with intuitively compelling 
but incorrect answers. This is like the bat and the ball thing, but everybody already knows about the bat and the ball, so we made up Adam and Mark. Uh, but whatever, it's, you know, so there's three of these questions like ages of Adam and Mark add up to 28. Uh, Mark is 20 years older than Adam. How many years old is Adam? Uh, and you know, there's an intuitively compelling answer and then an actually correct answer. And so if you split people based on how well they do, the, the prediction is this spillover effect from the incentive that they face uh, should be bigger for people that are more inclined to go with these automatic responses, less inclined to sort of uh, pay the cognitive cost to figure out what's actually going on. <clears throat> And indeed, we find this interaction in predicting play in the second stage in the one-shot games. We find this interaction between uh, experimental condition and the number of wrong answers they give. And it's, uh, it's like a really, sorry, this is a little mock-up of people not thinking about it and people thinking carefully about it. Uh, and for the people that think carefully about it, uh, sorry, for the people that, that, that give the wrong answers on the test, that just sort of go with their unconditional response, there's this big treatment effect. This is averaged over all of the one-shot games, whereas for the people that carefully think about it and get all those questions right, there's no treatment effect at all. So maybe that was a long answer to your question. But uh, yes, I think that there's also experimental evidence in favor of, this, uh, of the why reason, which is you're doing the thing that is typically payoff maximizing. Um, all right. Other questions? All right, cool. So I will talk a little bit then about this extension that uh, relates to uh, what's getting asked about. So, and it's particularly to the sort of flexibility of the intuitive response. And so it turns out that if you make the, if you relax the total flexibility of the costly re uh, response, that doesn't make any qualitative difference. It's just, well, it's, pretty boring, but uh, when you allow some amount of flexibility in the automatic uh, process, um, that does make a big difference. And so now we're going to show you a model where instead of a choice between no cost unconditional behavior and costly conditional behavior, you have a choice between no cost noisy conditioning, where it can condition but gets it wrong sometimes, versus costly accurate conditioning. And just to show you, this is a little diagram from before. Uh, everything that's showing right now is the same as it was in the old model. So you pick a cost of flexibility. If it's too big, then you go down. Or I guess if it's small enough, if it's less than your threshold, then you pay for accurate conditioning. And you just choose a strategy that matches the type of game that you're in. Uh, but um, in the new version, if the cost is too big, so you go down the noisy conditioning route, um, it selects which type of game it is, and then there's some probability that your conditioning is accurate. And so it, with probability A, it's accurate. And so that means you use this kind of no cost one shot strategy when you're in one shot, and you use the no cost repeated strategy when you're in the repeated game. But with probability 1 minus A, this, uh, it gets it wrong. And so you wind up using your no cost repeated strategy, even though it's a one shot game, or your no cost one strat one-shot strategy even though it's a repeated game. Does that make sense? Or questions about that? OK. And so the question is, what are the consequences of this? And uh, one thing is that when you do the equilibrium analysis, you see that uh, there are two equilibria that are basically analogous to our old equilibria. This is a strategy that always defects. So it's no cost one shot is equal to its no cost repeated, which is just don't cooperate, and it never pays for flexibility and the default cooperator who says, I'm basically going to ignore the signal that I'm getting from the noisy conditioning. And even if the noisy conditioning uh, response tells me it's a one-shot game, I'm still going to cooperate. So this is you know, noisy one-shot is equal to noisy repeated is cooperate. Um, and it has that same sort of uh, threshold from before, which is the money you save by not uh, cooperating in, in one-shot games. Um, but the thing is that if A is sufficiently large, so if, the, if your sort of automatic response is sufficiently accurate, there comes a new equilibrium which uh, uses that information. And basically it says my noisy one-shot behavior and my accurate one-shot behavior is to defect. My noisy repeated and my sort of accurate repeated is to cooperate. T is some big complicated expression that's not readily interpretable. But the point is that in this strategy, both the sort of 
noisy and the accurate responses want to do the same thing, which is defect in one shot and cooperate and repeated, um, but still you're willing to pay to condition because sometimes because the uh, accurate one is more accurate. So here you're just paying for accuracy rather than paying for sort of qualitatively changing what the what the behavior is. And now I'm just going to show you the the sort of who wins in the evolutionary simulations as a function of the probability of it being repeated game and how accurate the noisy conditioning is. So along uh, the bottom axis, this is the same as the um, original model where there's no signal at all in the noisy conditioning and you just get it's uh, always defect until some critical probability of repeated game where it transitions to the default cooperator strategy. Um, but as uh, the noisy conditioning gets more accurate, this sort of full conditioner strategy wins sometimes. And there's a few interesting features of this. First of all, one feature is that this blue area is big which is to say, even when your noisy conditioning gets quite accurate, so say like up at this point where there's say like 80% chance of repeated games and accuracy conditioning is 85% right. Even 85% right is a lot of signal, but this strategy, this, this winning strategy ignores that signal and says even though when my intuition tells me I'm in a one-shot game, there's an 85% chance that it's right, I'm still gonna ignore that and cooperate because uh, it's, you know, it's very costly to get it wrong when you're actually in a repeated game. Um, so this is sort of suggesting that the simplification in the original model is actually something that uh, you might expect to really observe in the world, even though in reality, the sort of automatic system is reasonably flexible. There are strategic reasons to ignore that flexibility. Um, so that's one interesting thing. Another interesting thing is that in this region, um, it becomes uh, true, it's no longer the case that um, being flexible only reduces cooperation because in this, in this full conditioner strategy, uh, and so this maybe say is a situation where the cues are pretty good, maybe some kinds of in-group, out-group type interactions where out-group interactions are usually one shot, in-group interactions are usually repeated, so group membership is a reasonable cue for uh, you know, whether you should be cooperating or not. And this says you have an in your sort of noisy uh, cue based response say, when you play with an outgroup member says don't cooperate because there, it's probably a one shot game. But if you pay for flexibility and you realize that it's actually a repeated game, then you'd be like, oh, actually this is a place where my sort of implicit bias or whatever is wrong. I'm gonna overrule it and switch to cooperating. So you can actually get deliberate or you know paying for flexibility and deliberating, getting you increased cooperation in the context of repeated games here. Um, and the last just sort of little cute thing is that um, in this region, uh, in general, you would expect that making the noisy conditioning strategy more accurate should make people more inclined to use the noisy conditioning, which is what happens over here. You know, as you go up, you get this transition from ignoring the signal and the noisy. Uh, conditioning to actually conditioning on it. Uh, but the thing that happens over here is this guy never pays for uh, flexibility at all, and this guy does. And so what happens is here making the, uh, the noisy system more accurate can actually make people uh, less inclined to use the noisy system because it helps solve the coordination problem that was the, the downfall of flexibility uh, before, which is to say that if the, um, if the noisy system has some amount of signal, then when you find yourself in a repeated game, even if a lot of the time people aren't cooperating, there's still the sort of baseline probability that the other person is going to be conditional and is going to realize it's a repeated game and cooperate. And so there's some benefit to you cooperating. And so you don't get this race to the bottom. You get a race down a little bit, but not all the way to the, to the floor. And, any, and so the other broader uh, point from this is I've still, in this model, we're only talking about two different processes, like a relatively uh, you know, noisy one and a relatively accurate one. But this sort of gives you a roadmap for what you could expect if you have a whole range of processes that are varying in their accuracy and getting applied in different kinds of situations. Um, you know, this is sort, sort of towards building a more general uh, theory of what to expect in this ease versus flexibility trade-off. Um.
All right. So uh, I assume that the fact that it starts seven minutes late doesn't mean it ends seven minutes late. Is that <laughs> uh, OK, that's cool. Um, so to summarize, uh, the idea is that broadly, um, when future consequences exist, it can create incentives to cooperate, um, which explains a lot of strategic cooperation. Uh, and, and if you add this ease flexibility trade off to these sort of standard game theoretic models that don't have a cognitive dimension, um, then it can help to explain why people cooperate even in the pure situations where no such incentives exist. Uh, and in particular, um, the, idea, the, the idea is that this sort of unconditional play is going to wind up favoring, is going to be a heuristic that's going to favor the behavior that's typically advantageous. Um, and so that's you know, going to lead you to cooperate. And a cool result is that you can, selection can wind up favoring this unconditional behavior, even in situations where there is some potential to, signal, uh, to condition. It's just uh, noisy. Then sometimes you may wind up wanting to ignore that information. Um, and uh, there's a lot of experimental evidence in support of the key predictions uh, of this theoretical account. <laughs>